We're wrapping the battery, having more 3D printing issues, finally getting around to assembling the rest of the build and taking it out for a ride. We got a lot to get through, so let's go. This is where I left off last week. We pretty much have the 3D printed battery box completed as well as the initial foundation frame is fully assembled. As most of you guys are aware that almost every battery that's made comes with this blue heat shrink and that's great if you're a big fan of the color blue but sometimes it just doesn't go with the aesthetics of your build. So I'm going to be changing the color by throwing on this carbon matte finish vinyl wrap. This is one of the simplest, cheapest cheapest and easiest ways to change the color of your battery without going through too much trouble. Speaking of cheap and easy, let's talk about this battery. This battery was one of the cheapest ones I have found that was 48 volts and did give you roughly a somewhat good amp hour rating. This is 14 amp hours but I am highly skeptical that it actually outputs that. But it was cheap and that is the theme of this budget build so here I am trying to stuff the over wrapped battery in to the battery box and it just barely fits. And when I say barely, I mean it almost does not fit. Alright, so while assembling, I had a little bit of an oopsie, as you can see right there. I was trying to fit the other side on the battery while it was resting on the frame, and because this PETG filament is so slippery, it slipped right off the frame and landed on the corner. It did protect the battery, but it did also break my 30 hour print. But no problem, I wanted to make it a little bit bigger, and yeah, that's when I started having multiple issues with trying to reprint this very long print. I don't know what happened here. Everything was stringing at the higher layers and I had to stop the print so I was trying everything at this point creating enclosures to keep all the heat in to prevent bowing. I had about four failed 30 hour prints and I was just really not having it. After growing tired of that I thought let's speed up the printing process and change the nozzle but yeah then I broke off the old nozzle trying to get it out of the heating element so I wasn't super happy about that. If you're new to 3D printing do not make my noob mistake which was not heating up the extruder before trying to remove the nozzle. If you do that you're gonna break it off in the heating element just like I did and then you'll probably have to buy a new one just like I did. So new heater block I put a 1.0 millimeter nozzle which is gonna lay down some very fat lines and it's not gonna look as good but it will be a lot faster. This nozzle took a 30 hour print and trimmed it down to six hours, which is really good because I was tired of waiting 24 hours only to realize I had a failed print. This was becoming very frustrating because when I compare my later prints to my first prints, my first ones were actually a lot better, although not perfect. The layer lines were very clean and I was actually pretty happy with them, but I just couldn't replicate that again. It's really unfortunate that I dropped this piece because I did have two sections that were actually very good and I was going to use them but as you can see my original testers, my cross sections, those came out really good and I think I understand why. Because this piece is so long, when the pieces that I'm printing are smaller, they're more towards the center of the bed which is where the heating element is. So the further out from the center, the more chances you're going to have cooling at the extremities so it's going to start bowing and warping but here is my 1.0 nozzle and as you can see it is not pretty but it is actually very strong. These two pieces are considerably more rigid and they just feel a lot stronger when compared to the original pieces that I had made. There are pros and cons to both. Obviously you get a much faster print time and it is stronger but it definitely doesn't look as nice. Thank you. 
Because I had sunk so much time in trying to make that 3D printed battery box work, I forgot that I had to finish the rest of the build. I am going to give myself a little bit of slack because this is my first 3D printed part and it is a pretty significant one. I spent about two weeks just trying to get two halves that were somewhat usable and decent to fit the battery and with the nozzle breaking while I was trying to change that and just trying all different settings, moving my 3D printer to the basement, trying everything to get at least two good decent prints, it took so much longer than I had wished for. And with all that finally out of the way, I can move on to things that are hopefully going to be a lot more enjoyable and that is finishing the rest of this e-bike build. I have received a lot of passionate comments about torque arms and here I am trying to put some torque arms on this build because I know a lot of you are going to be very very excited and happy about that. This is the first bike I have ever put torque arms on and I will tell you that it's a bit of a pain because you have to remove the connector and then reconnect all the connections after you pass it through the torque arm so make sure you take a picture so you know how to line up all the colors and the pins. Some of you guys have very strong opinions about torque arms and I also have some very strong opinions about them but I'm going to save that for another dedicated video all about torque arms. These torque arm kits are relatively inexpensive but they do come with these gigantic hose clamps and you have to clamp them over both of the rear tubes. This is all fine and dandy for the right side but the left side is definitely going to interfere with your chain so you're gonna have to pick up some smaller hose clamps that only clamp over one of the tubes and I also think they look quite a bit better. Now we can actually mount the battery. I'm using two of the older pieces that I was able to salvage but I do have the thicker layer lined ones as a backup that if any of these break at any time I can just replace them with the stronger ones. I'm trying my best to discreetly mount the controller underneath the battery and for that I only have to drill one hole in the frame. That's because I'm reusing that shock mount bolt on the right side so I don't have to make any more holes in this frame than I absolutely have to. Unfortunately I had to make this hole just a little bit bigger and then I broke off one of my drill bits inside of it. It was easy to get out but that was the first drill bit I have ever broken and I'm not sure why it broke. The wiring is very straightforward or at least it should be. This part was the easiest part just lining up the colors of the phase wires. That is not foreshadowing. It always goes perfectly. There are never problems ever. The battery did come with its own male connector for the other side, the controller side. So I'm just soldering that on instead of the ring connectors that came with it. If you're new to e-bikes you definitely don't need to solder these connections. They make tons of crimps. They make crimps with solder it's very easy to make different connectors and adaptations but if you know how to solder that's also a very good way to do it. Here I am powering it on for the first time just to do a systems check and yeah the bike runs backwards. I usually like my e-bikes to roll forwards so now I have to investigate why that is and after a lot of googling because this is the first time I have ever had to do this. At this point I have built so many e-bikes I have lost count but this was the first ever kit I have made that didn't have the phase wires match up to their colors and I had to figure out which wires go to which and they're all completely mismatched as you can see here. I spent about a half an hour just flipping around wires. Not only did I do all the phase wire combinations because it's quite a bit, I also did some of the hall sensor wires because I read that that also can be the culprit. But after messing around with all that, I finally was able to get the tire to rotate in the correct direction, which is forward. That's the way you want your bike to go. If you're piecing your kit together and you buy a controller from somebody else and a motor from somebody else, if the phase wire colors don't match up, that is understandable. But if you are selling a kit where you have the controller and the motor that are supposed to work together and the phase wire colors do not match up, that is unforgivable. But also to be fair, I can't really complain because this was the cheapest kit available and sometimes you get what you pay for. 
Here I am making my own half grip for the left hand side because I'll usually move the gear selector to the left side so I have the right side with the throttle. I actually entirely removed the left gear selector because I don't need 21 speeds. I don't even really need three speeds. I don't know anyone that needs 21 speeds. Front derailers are always a pain and it brings me much joy when I can ever remove them. So I try to do that as often as possible. Now that I'm almost completely done with the assembly, there is no way I'm leaving that controller silver because it is going to look much better in black. After mounting the controller, I'm also going to be wrapping all the wires in some fabric tape because I think it just adds that finishing touch which makes everything look a lot cleaner. As you can see, I did leave a little bit of the phase wire colors still left showing because if I cover those up, it's going to be even harder to get the sequence right if I ever need to change the rear tire. If you want to take it a step further, you just get some heat shrink in those same colors so you can make your own color match or just label them with written labels. Even though this bike is very budget friendly, that doesn't mean it has to look terrible and taking some extra time to do some cable management always makes your builds look a lot better. At this point, the only thing really left to do is take it out for a ride. The best way I can describe riding this bike is that it is extremely smooth. All of the regular framed e-bikes I've built so far have been hardtails, so having this rear shock definitely makes a huge difference in terms of comfort and ride quality. You can't ask much out of a build that is this budget friendly and cheap, but even though the suspension components are definitely not high grade or even good by any standards, having a terrible suspension is better than having no suspension. And this suspension isn't even terrible. When you consider the price, it's actually pretty good. And for the price, this is a very good platform and a very nice frame for how little it costs. Now, even though this bike is only a thousand watts, this is one of the lowest powered builds I have ever made. And even still, this bike is very fast and it is a lot of fun. I did speed run this bike and it hit 25 miles per hour with no pedaling. I think when I add my own pedal power, I could get this going 28, 30 miles per hour, which is very fast for a bicycle, much faster than most people would probably feel comfortable on a bike like this. I did do a bit of a range test. I used it to commute to my work, which is about 13 miles from my house. And when I got there, I had more than half a charge left. So I'm pretty confident that this bike could probably do about 30 to 35 miles total. I do like how simple and no frills this build is. You just press the button to turn it on, twist the throttle and go and then press the button when you're done and that's it. I do think a voltmeter would be a little more helpful because all you get is the three LEDs to let you know how much of a charge you have left but you can easily add one of those as a hand grip so that's not too big of a deal. One of my biggest gripes does have to do with the controller because this controller is designed to give you very smooth soft accelerations and that is really good for your drivetrain that's good for your battery that's good for everything except for the fun factor this is actually a benefit for new riders or people not used to having a throttle on their bike so i can see that as a safety feature in some regards it's also again better for your bike but as for me i'm used to very high powered bikes with a ton of acceleration so to me this just feels very soft and weak compared to what i'm used to but again everything is relative. I wish more kits had flexible controllers so you can change those parameters. Some of them do, some of them don't. Usually you have to pay a lot more for those features. This is one of the cheapest e-bikes I have ever made which was kind of the goal and everything came out to a little over 500 bucks which to me for what you get is a lot of bike for not a lot of money. I think this build came out awesome. It looks really cool and unique and I want to thank you guys so much for watching all the way to the end. I really appreciate it. But let me know what you guys think. Stay tuned and I will see you in the next one.